Be not dismayed, whatever be tight, God will take care of you. Beneath His wings, let love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day all the way. He will take care of you. Take care of you. God will take care of you through every day and all the way. He He'll take care of you. Oh, God will take care. God will take care. Oh, God will take care. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in thy sight. O God, you are our strength and our redeemer. Be with us today in the joys and the sorrows, in the peaks and the valleys, in the daybreak and even God in those who are going through midnight in the mix of emotions we pray that you be with us come alongside Lord Jesus each of us the new morning more new morning mercies that suit our case now God that your word go forth never to come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Now please remain standing with me, uh, sitting up, tilted up, and um, turn with me to the 118th Psalm the 118th Psalm, and I want to read the 22nd uh, through the 24th verse. Uh, I want to reach back to the 22nd and capture the whole phrase. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Scripture as it is written, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated, you may tilt back, lay back in the presence of the Lord and whoever else's presence you happen to be in. And we continue again in this fall sermon series um, uh, entitled generally A Faith for Uncertain Times. And this is the 10th installment of Faith 
run certain times and this week's particular installment part 10 is subtitled finally finally i want to pause and thank these young people uh these youth for singing this morning uh I, we have a bright future this kind of talent so resounding so great here and in the digisphere give them a hand i thank god for them amen and for their, uh, the young adult who's leading the youth, Sister uh, Jeanne, we thank God for this marvelous, miraculous uh, talent uh, and musician. Uh, her music ministry makes our ministry greater and better and more brilliant. I like coming behind good singing. Nothing makes preaching more difficult than bad singing because then you got to start preaching while people are angry. <laughs> Amen. Good singing warms people up it makes some it melts the iceberg amen it makes them want to hear something i remember my grandmother who's gone home to glory now a woman got up and sang her favorite song blessed assurance and her and the key that the song was written in were not in agreement and my grandmother who was the soul of compassion leaned over you know as sometimes church women do when they're upset and angry and she spoke loud enough for everybody in her seating section including me as a little boy hear her say that woman killed my song and i'm so glad that you gave the song life and didn't didn't kill it and i thank god for the one rooster in, the, in y'all's bits we need to do something to get we need to pray for more roosters amen <laughs> We don't have too many hens, but we need to increase our rooster participation within our music ministry. Somebody say, pray for the roosters. Amen. We need some cock-a-doodle-doing, and and that's that's the rooster's job. But you hold down the fort, because I believe in God that help is on the way. Amen. In May of 1989, my mother, Claudette Nash, was among the hundreds who crossed the stage on a sun-splashed day at the convocation for the Evergreen State College and received her Bachelor of Arts degree, May of 1989. It was five months before her 50th birthday. Five months before her 50th birthday. Ironically, I, as one of her five children, was the first person in the family uh, to graduate college and had, set, and had since graduated uh, from graduate school with a master's degree and was two years into my first pastorate, Roland. And I came home and joined my other siblings with a bachelor's and a master's in hand to see Mama finally get her bachelor's degree at 49 years, almost 50 years of age and and spliced in between her torrent of hallelujahs and thank you Jesus's was her exultant cry finally finally you got to understand the force and the thrust behind that exultant cry it had been 15 years earlier when she had gotten her associate of arts degree from Western Washington College in a program referred to as new careers uh, a government program that provided both tuition and child care for women on public assistance with multiple children. Um, you got to understand the force behind that because it goes back further than the Associate of Arts degrees. It goes back all the way to when she graduated in 1957 from Lincoln High School in Tacoma, center of the known world, Lincoln, the only school in Tacoma that matters. And she graduated an honor roll student. And in a perfect world, she should have gone on to the college of her choice. But the world was very imperfect then. Ain't perfect now, but it was more imperfect then. And uh, for most black girls coming from uh, poor or modest income black families, there was no colleges to attend and no means to attend those colleges. And instead, she ended up getting married. And this was the first of two marriages that went in when husbands ended up incarcerated. And so mama ended up spending all of those years um, uh, raising five children on her own. 
five children on her own, former honor roll student, should have gone to the college of her choice, struggled all those years trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. She was every bit of what Tupac was talking about, saying to, to all the ladies raising babies on your own, I know it's kind of rough and you're feeling all alone. Daddy's long gone and they left you while you're lonesome. Thank the Lord for your kids, even if nobody else want them. But I know you can make it. In fact, I'm sure. And if you fall, stand tall and come back for more. Because ain't nothing worse than when your son wants to know why his daddy don't love him no more. You can't complain you was dealt this hell of a hand without a man feeling helpless. Too many things for you to deal with, dying inside on the outside looking fearless. But while the tears are rolling down your cheek, you're just hoping things don't all fall this week. Because if they did, you couldn't take it. But don't blame me. I was given this world that didn't make it. And while your son's getting older and older and cold, having the world on his shoulders, and while the rich friends are driving bins, I'm just trying to hold on to surviving friends. This is still can make it. Uh, and while the rich kids are driving bins, I'm just trying to hold on to surviving friends. And we can make it. So keep your head up. I'm going to polish it up for the second service. But she made it. Keep your head up. And you can almost hear in the background Sam Cook singing, uh, it's a long time coming. Finally, at 50 years of age to get something that one of her children got when he was 22. Finally. Finally, and sometimes my brothers and sisters, something that is a thing to celebrate and appreciate on its own is even more greatly appreciated when you were forced to wait on it. And you have that sense in the air today throughout the land as you almost hear the nation, at least half the nation, at least almost 51 percent of the nation is saying, finally, finally, four years that seem like an eternity is over. Four years of disrespect, denigration, division. Four years of incompetence and lack of empathy. Four years of insult. Four years of misogyny without apology. Four years of racism on the loose. Four years of the nation losing its standing in the world. Four years of the world's previous indispensable nation abdicating leadership in environmental concerns and in uh, uh, peace treaties and in nuclear deals. Four years of, of seeing the uh, people leadership appealing to our lower uh, instincts rather than our higher angels. Four years of wondering when this is going to end. Four years of white supremacists and domestic terrorists being referred to as fine people to four years of people giving uh, carte blanche to the police, showing no compassion for people of color being shot dead in the streets. Four years of being insulted and slighted and tweeted at four years, four years of dealing with the cult and the cronies and the enablers and, and the predators. Four years of wondering, Lord, when is this going to end? And finally, finally, in the form of 75 million ballots, the wicked, for at least for a season, have, may not have ceased from troubling, but they can't do it from the White House come January 20. Four years, finally. Finally, the nation, there's a sense of relief, even from some in the opposing party, a sense of relief. You can almost see it with Joe Biden, president-elect, a sense of finally. On the very day that he was declared uh, president-elect, it was 48 years to the day that he was first elected to public office. And who would have thought then that 48 years later, only then, would he fulfill his dream of becoming president elect to become president, the 46th president of these United States of America after not one and not two, uh, but now on his third time was the charm in his effort to become president of the United States finally. And you could almost hear the finally coming from the lips of Kamala Harris, vice president 
uh, elect. The first woman uh, who happens to be the, uh, a black woman elected to be vice president of these United States of America. The first black woman, the strongest thing America ever made out of a need of survival was a black woman. You can almost hear the shouts and the echoes from the Sojourner Truths and the Harriet Tubman's. Sojourner Truth, who said in her iconic poem, Ain't I a woman said, I bore the lash like any man. I toted the barge and lifted the bale like any man. Bore 13 children, had all of them sold away from me but one. None heard my cry but Jesus. And ain't I a woman? A black woman, the strongest thing America ever had. Harriet Tubman, who found her way to freedom, went back across the Mason-Dixon line, put her own freedom at risk to take other people to freedom. A woman of diminutive stature, less than five feet, had a sleeping disease, more than once had to put the nozzle of her pistol into the nostril of a man twice her size to tell him you either gonna go with me and live in freedom or you're gonna die here in the swamp country because you ain't going back because if you do they'll torture you till you tell them where the rest of us are she had she had the Bible in one hand a pistol in another and the love of Jesus in the heart and the willingness to pull a trigger a, the, a black woman the strongest thing America ever had finally finally on behalf of the Jorana Lees and the Ida B Wells Barnett's who fought for anti-lynching legislation at the beginning of the 20th century and could not get any response from the then racist occupant of the White House, Woodrow Wilson, and yet gave their babies to the older black women while the black men were in hiding because the news was the Klan was riding through little town in Tennessee. They put six shooters on their hip, cut off the Klan and turned them back when they said with opugnancy that you got to go through through us before you put a finger on any black any one of our black men I'm telling you a black woman is the strongest thing that America ever made and made it out of necessity to the Rosa Parks who sat down and when sitting down made black people all across this country stand up to the Ella Bakers and the Dorothy Hikes and uh, the uh, Shirley Chisholm's of this world to all of the fictitious Seelys who were slapped around by the misters and the very real Tina's who had to deal with the ice and to my big mama who on yet four 28 years ago to the day on yesterday I stood and did her funeral at the Bethlehem Baptist Church in Tacoma Washington and who would have thought when I was funeralizing my mother Roland my grandmother Roland 28 years ago that 28 years later that the first woman who happened to be a black woman would be declared president-elect of these United States of America I could hear her from glory saying finally and hallelujah in cadence with Aretha Franklin who's also in the balconies of heaven singing R-E-S-P-E-C-T oh, that's all I want is a little respect black women for 401 years have been the most disrespected the most damned the most despised creature in American society the strongest thing America ever made out of a need to survive and yet for 401 years all they've wanted was a little respect not only when they get home but when they get to the job when they get to their churches when they get to the Congress and when they get to the White House and now my brothers and sisters just think about every time they say to Kamala get her name right Kamala that when they say Madam Vice President every time they say that they got to pay homage to my big mama to Seely to Tina to Sojourner to Harriet to every black woman who's ever cried over this way that with tears has been watered and think about it when Joe Biden does his first State of the Union address over his shoulder will be two women Women. One will be Miss Nancy, the Speaker of the House, and the other will be Kamala, the first woman who happens to be a black woman, Vice President of these United States of America. Finally, showing up in places they had the ability to be all along, but because of glass ceilings, they were not allowed to be where they wanted to be and we needed them to be and should be sometimes something that is an achievement to accomplish on its own is all the sweeter because you had to wait on it. And my brothers and my sisters, that's a sentiment in the text that I lift up before you today. When we hear this text that was used as liturgy in ancient Israel's worship, 
but reflects back to a time in the life of David and also some historians believe was used secondarily, Clarence, uh, to refer to in the life of post-exilic Israel and reflects the whole people of God. See, sometimes it's about an achievement in the life of an individual and sometimes it's about an achievement in the life of a community or a nation. The stone that the builders rejected. God has made the capstone of the, has made the capstone of the building. King James says the stone of the builders rejected. God has made the headstone of the corner. And here it just says the capstone. In the building of a house, the first thing you set was the capstone and everything else was built upon and along the capstone. You had to set the capstone because the capstone was the foundation of the house. Such irony that a rejected stone becomes the capstone that everything else is resting upon and building upon. And you have King David. David, who sees himself as a rejected stone in the providence of God, become a capstone. Three things we learn from the life of David that is woven into uh, the words of this text. And number one is that in the economy of God, God can take unlikely persons and make them key and critical persons. Come on, somebody. God can take unlikely persons and make them the key and the critical persons. In the economy, God, some, sometimes the first becomes last and the last becomes first. The same God who can pull down the powerful and the wicked is a God who can lift up the lowly and put them in places that only you and God believe they could be there in the first place. David was a lowly stone. His daddy was a shepherd. His sons were then shepherds. But David was the eighth and the last of Jesse's sons. When God became Sick and tired of the first king of Israel, who was Saul. But it seems that, as it turns out, Saul was tall, and that's all. And he disappointed God. See, uh, people can elect you, but God can still reject you. And it seems that after Saul found himself king, that Saul did not get a renewal of his monarchical contract, Roland. He didn't get a second term. He was tall, and that's all. And God dispatched Samuel per the rituals of Israel where the priest would anoint the prophet, uh, would anoint the king. And so Samuel was sent on a day trip from God to go and find the future king of Israel and, and went and saw Jesse, told him to bring out his son, starting with the eldest, moving to a least, and in a culture that believed in order, that the eldest goes first. God has a way of inverting the values of society, turning them upside down till he turns them right side up, and sometimes the last becomes first and the first becomes last. And David, who was the eighth and final son of Jesse, was the one that Samuel, inspired by the Spirit of God, deemed to be the future king of Israel, laid his hands on David at only eight to 12 years of age. King James says he was a ruddy lad, clean shaven, which means he, had, he was a prepubescent child who didn't have a whisker on his face yet and what looked like nothing but a little child still involved in child's play. David or Samuel looked at him through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and saw Israel's future king and laid his hands on him. And he laid his hands on David at eight to ten years of age that David, the lowly son of a lowly family, would become the future king of Israel. There's a song that says what God has for me, he has for me. And uh, the where I come from does not necessarily indicate where I'm headed. Have I got a witness up in here? And I, I, I was among the two million people, Clarence, that jammed uh, in Washington, D.C., somewhere between the Capitol building and the Washington Monument on January the 20th, 2009, when Barack Hussein Obama, who was the product of an 
unwed mother uh, from Kansas and a father from Kenya who took off early in the life of Barack Hussein Obama and did not come back. And, uh, and then she had another child by a man of color who uh, took off. And here was a woman, uh, a young white woman with two biracial children who then got cancer to make the story worse, who then her two middle-aged white parents who know nothing about people of color had to raise these two biracial children. And uh, in his identity confusion as Barry from Hawaii, long before Jeremiah Wright turned him into Barack from Chicago he experimented with cocaine trying to find himself and in the providence of God in his winding meandering course that somehow or another God made a way from him from the broken home and the sick mama that he came from to put one hand on the Bible and raise the other hand before the Supreme Court Chief Justice Roberts and take the oath of office as the 44th president of these United States of America sometimes the rejected stone can become the headstone of the corner and what God has for me he has for me but not only does it work for biracial brothers from broken families it also works for poor white folks uh, who grow up with a speech impediment who have to learn how to slow down speak in slower cadences so your tongue don't cling to the roof of your mouth and who come from families who have to move from one place to another because they can't find a job who then get elected to office young but then tragedy strikes not once not twice burying children burying wives and then bury other children when they get grown and still God at a time when most people have long been into retirement will give you a grace of longevity and strength put some pep in your step when most people are sitting down because God wants to write another chapter I'm telling you God can take rejected stones and make them the headstone of the corner. And if that's not enough, God can take a little colored girl from the busing and all of that controversy whose parents divorced early in life from a mixed marriage, part black, part Jamaican, part Indian, so mixed up in there, but she a woman of a whole lot of stratums and then takes this young woman who didn't go to Harvard, didn't go to Princeton, went to the real elite schools, the HBCUs, come on somebody, H-U, and now now, the when they say Madam President, they got to recognize all of those HBCUs go, that have produced our leaders from Martin King and the others who've been singing We Shall Overcome. And now our drum beats, our step, our rhythm and our rhyme is going to be in the house. The rejected stones can become the headstone of the corner. The rejected stones can become the headstones of the corner. So some of the lessons that we learn here, Roosevelt, is that in the economy of God, that, that a dream deferred is not necessarily a dream denied. If you don't learn nothing else, a dream deferred is not necessarily a dream denied. 1951, Langston Hughes, come here, poet laureate, he asked the question, when we're living in the tension between a dream and our hearts that, that, that yet has been denied by a culture who doesn't want to do right by your kind, when, when the dream deferred, some people think a dream deferred is a dream denied, sometimes a dream deferred is just that, it's deferred, even though those who are trying to deny it those who are trying to deny it don't want you to ever get it but because God has the last word what some intend to deny God will only allow it to be deferred and Langston Hughes asked the question well what happens when our dream is deferred if you're black if you're woman if you're LGBTQ if you're of mixed race if you were born foreign born in another place if you are disabled what happens when your dream is deferred does it dry up like a raisin in the sun do you stop dreaming the dream does it fester like a sore and then run do you you get sick and toxic with your anger and your resentment? Does it stink like rotten meat? Does it crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Does it sad like a heavy load? Or does it explode? Dream within a dream. Our dreams deferred. Somebody said justice deferred is justice denied. No, sometimes justice deferred. Sometimes justice deferred. It's not denied. It's just deferred because in God's own time, there comes a day when we can say finally, 
finally, what would be something to celebrate under any circumstances is all the sweeter because as the same David w- would say that I waited patiently on the Lord because from, there's always a gap between when the dream was first held in heart, first, first perceived, and the time of, time of fulfillment. And it's in the in-between time. It's a mean time. And in that mean time, the in-between time, which can be a lean time and a hard time, we've got a learn to wait on the Lord this David had Samuel place his hand on him Clarence when he was 8 to 12 years of age but the record is clear he would not become king of Judah until he was 30 17 potentially hard years later He was anointed as the future king of Israel, but there was a 17-year gap between his anointing as the future king of Israel in Bethlehem to where he received his coronation roses in Hebron. 17-year gap. And even then, When he got a chance to be king of Israel, that was not the end of the story. That was just the beginning of his opportunity to serve. And let's be clear this morning, for the president-elect and the vice president-elect, that this is not the end of the story. The goal was not to get elected. That was the means to the end. The goal is to make this a more perfect union, to make America decent again, to make America stable again, to make America respected again, to make America competent again again, to make America recognizable again, to make America pursue being a more perfect union again, to make America appeal to our higher angels and not our lower instincts again. And so now the real work begins. For David, once he got when he got on the throne as the king of Judah, he, the nation would then go through a civil war where the two southern tribes would fight the ten northern tribes. And after the war, then he would have to pull the shrine from the northern places of Dan and Beersheba and relocated down to Jerusalem. Then he would have to reclaim the Ark of the Covenant that fell into the hands of the Philistines, their natural enemies, seize the Ark, bring it down to Jerusalem. Then they would have to conquer Jerusalem and drive out the Canaanites that had been there for a thousand years. And then he'd have to raise the ancient gates of of Jerusalem and then enter the Ark of the Covenant uh, so that that they could march in singing, lift up your head, all ye gates, be lifted up ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty in battle. He became king of Judah in, in when he was 30 years of age, but he was 37 years of age before he had consolidated the nation into one central monarchy headquartered in the capital in Jerusalem. The becoming king was only the beginning of his work and not the end. The election outcome was great, but it's only the beginning of getting a handle on a pandemic. Only the beginning of trying to heal the re- economy. It's only the beginning of trying to unify a divided people. It's only the beginning of trying to push the white nationalists and white supremacists back in their pit. It's only the beginning of trying to get back into a climate accord to avoid an environmental apocalypse. It's only the beginning of continuing to advance women's rights and and gender and, and, and sexual minorities' rights. And, and only the beginning of trying to deal with systemic racism. It's only the beginning of trying to make our world a better place. It's only the beginning. David says, the stone that the builders rejected, God has now made the headstone of the corner to begin a work that required him to be the headstone of the corner. But he's very clear. Not only did God take lowly people from lowly places to put them in high places to do a great thing through them, But he wants us to know that he's not where he is because of his own shrewdness or greatness or necessarily even being deserving. He says, the Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. Well, David made some moves and decisions along the way, Roland, but he's clear at the end of the day, the Lord has done this. This is the Lord's will. And I believe today our nation is standing in a moment where the Lord did this. 
You can talk about red mirages and blue waves all you want to. You can talk about voting in person or early voting, or you can talk about uh, uh, mail-in voting, and you can talk about micro-targeting in terms of election, and all that stuff had its way. You can talk about Stacey Abrams and taking the Black Lives Movement and turning it from a message to a movement to a machine. All those things matter. You can talk about dollars raised so that they can outspend the other side in TV advertisement. You can talk about all those things, but at the end of the day, it worked out because it was God's will. God has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. In this text where if you look at verse 15 and verse 20, David talks about the righteous. He does not present the righteous as those who necessarily have proven themselves worthy. No, his, his reference to righteous has nothing to do with moral merit. No, and moral merit does matter, but that at the end of the day is not owing to where you end up in life. Because uh, sometimes we end up where we are despite us and not because of us. I wish I had a witness in here. Some of you got some blessings today despite you and not necessarily because you, because if it was simply an adding up of your merits and demerits, you wouldn't be nowhere close to where you are today. He has looked beyond your faults. Oh, come on. Somebody should have shouted and fell out right there. He has looked beyond your faults and saw your need. God has done some things for me despite me and not because of me. When David talks about the righteous throughout this passage, he's not talking about those who have proven themselves deserving. Rather, he's talking about those who understand that their life and their future is is owed to God. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in my eyes. I'm celebrating the fact that it, it is the way it is because it was God's will for it to be the way that it come on somebody Jeanne you got your gift uh, not because of hard work you've worked hard but there are others who have worked just as hard but they just ain't got the gift it was God's will the Lord has blessed you and it's marvelous in our eyes come on somebody and, and the Lord has brought this this new dawning to this nation and has ended the division or at least given us a chance and the hope of it the Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes Joe's where he is Kamala's where she is and Trump's on his way out because the Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. Congratulations, Joe. Congratulations, comma. But thank you, Jesus. The Lord has done this. The same Lord who can take lowly things and lift them to exalted places, take rejected stones, make them the headstone of the corner. And when he does, those cornerstones need to remember the Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our To all the veterans who put on the uniform, put yourself in harm's way. You came home while others came home in a box because the Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. And so then he says... This is the day (laughs) because of all that. See, I got to give you context before text. This is the day that the Lord hath made. And how are we going to respond to it? We shall rejoice and be glad. And and when he says this is the day, he's not talking about uh, um, November uh, the 9th, 2020. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. For Mama, he wasn't talking about May uh, 1989. For Barack, he wasn't talking about January 20th, uh, uh, 2009. The date on the calendar, the linear movement of chronological time is irrelevant. He's talking about the day, the, the, the inbreaking of the will of God, this episode in life, this season, this occurrence, this kairos moment, the moment pregnant with possibility, the moment where God's time intersects the linear movement of man's time, what is happening now, this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Not only is it the case, Roland, that a dream deferred is not a dream denied, but we also learn that that when we are broken along the way, that part of the breaking uh, is a part of the preparing. Did you catch that part of the breaking is part of the preparing. What are you talking about? David, in the time after he was anointed king, if you look at 1 Samuel in the 30th verse, you see a very sad chapter. When David was hiding among the Philistines from Saul, remember Saul? He was tall and that's all. 
While God was dealing with Saul, David had to hide out among Israel's arch enemies, the Philistines. And while he was hiding out among the Philistines, the Amalekites, another enemy of Israel, attacked the people of Israel, attacked David and his fighting men, attacked them at, uh, at Ziglag. And not, they, they burned up their property and took all their wives and their children hostage. When David and his fighting men who were hiding from Saul, who was tall, and that's all, and found out that their wives and children were missing and nowhere to be found, had become slaves of the Amalekites. It says the men who were fighting with David were so broken with grief, it said they couldn't speak, they could just cry, and then they all wanted to turn against David. David went before the Lord because he was at risk of being killed by his own men. And then he said, Lord, what shall I do? And the Lord told David, while David himself was broken with grief, he said, get the men together, take those who will fight with you, and go take back what the devil has stolen. 600 men set out, 200 along the way just couldn't take it. And then finally, with 400 men outnumbered, but the Lord on their side, they were able to go back, get their wives, get their children, because in God, even though we're broken along the way, that, that rejected stones who become cornerstones but because the Lord has made it that way even when we're outnumbered we can, once God puts us into the cornerstone position we can go and take back what the devil has stolen oh come on are somebody feeling me this morning I come to tell you that everything the devil stole these last four years we gonna take it back have I got a witness we gonna take back the pursuit for women's lives we gonna take back uh, the, the threat on 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 marriage choice people ought to be to marry who they want to. We're going to take back anything that they take away in terms of health care. We're going to take back seats stolen to the Supreme Court. We're going to take back the dignity that has been laid on the altar of egoism. Have I got a witness? Take back what the devil has stolen. We don't have to spend our time grieving and crying. Get up now. Now's the time to get up off our knees. Stop the lament and go and take back what the devil has stolen because God is on our side. Finally, we get a chance to fight. Finally, we have the reins of power. Finally, we can get in the game. Finally, we can launch the attack. Finally, we can pursue what God has for us. Finally, we can go from lament to rejoicing, from, from midnight to daybreak. Finally, there's an opportunity where the doors have been shut in our face. Finally, we've waited on the Lord. He may not have come when we wanted to. Oh, but God has stepped in right on time and so I come to tell you that today we celebrate we celebrate the fact that the rejected stones can become the headstone of the corner sometimes rejected stones are broken along the way have I got a witness sometimes rejected stones take nails in the hands and sometimes rejected stones take spikes in the feet and sometimes rejected stones take a spear in the side and sometimes rejected stones have crowns of thorns pressed to their brow sometimes Sometimes rejected stones are laid in tombs and buried, but what some people try to deny, God just defers it, maybe on Friday, maybe on Saturday, but come Sunday morning, the grave is empty, and this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Have I got a witness? There's always a day coming down the road when the wicked shall see some troubling and the weary shall be at rest. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. He'll open doors that have been shut and shut doors that no enemy can open. Have I got a witness? See ya. See ya. This is the day we prayed for it. We cried for it. We marched for it. Stood in line for it. Hoped for it. And now God has provided it. I don't know about you. Seem like it would be an insult to God if I couldn't wave my hand. Seem like we'd be slighting God if I didn't just stand up and say thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hey, hey, hey. What man cannot do, God can do all by himself. Have I got a witness? Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. 
Hey! 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 This is the day that the Lord hath made. It seemed to me it'd be an insult to God if we don't praise God. Sometimes the only authentic thing you can do is just praise God. Because we know where the blessing comes from. How many of you are out there in the digosphere or here know where the blessing has come from? I dare you right now to take a pause and worship and just praise God. Thank you, Lord. Just Thank open you, your Lord. mouth. Just raise your hand. Thank just you, slap Lord. your computer screen. Just look at somebody and say, I know that's right. Come on, somebody praise God. God is worthy to be praised. God is worthy. And I know we got a lot of difficult things ahead of us. 70 million people thought that this man was worthy worthy of a second term so we got a lot of work ahead of us but thank God for the opportunity to be about the work so let the work begin because God is on our side come on somebody thank God praise God praise God come on y'all saying this is the day this is the day that the Lord has made that the Lord has made I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I shall. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is. This is the day. Oh, yes, it is. This is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will. I will rejoice. I will. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. today and you've never accepted Christ in the pardon of your sins at the end of the day what I offer you is the same thing I always offer you and that is Christ as Savior and Lord if you've never received Christ in the pardon of your sins let today be the first day of your best life the first day of abundant life the first day of eternal life that is only found in the one name under the heavens by which you shall be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved to offer you Christ. There's a button on your computer screen that says, how do I become a member? How do I become a member of the body of Christ? 
as well as the local congregation. Hit that and someone will be there to receive your confession of faith and even talk to you about what it means to be saved. If you have accepted Christ some former time in your life but you need a church home, even in this virtual context where we're physically separated but very much one in the spirit, you can become a part of our church family by hitting that button. We pray that you do that. Let today be the first day of the rest of your life walking in solidarity with Jesus as Savior and Lord. What does it profit us to gain the whole world and lose our souls? Let your soul be saved and your life be redeemed and restored in Jesus' name.